Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 318 for February 5 of 2016. Bob Lutz, live, lively, and unscripted. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 20 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Gary Vasilash, good to be back in the studio doing a show. Yes, but, you know, last week we were sitting with the Pacific Ocean behind us. On the, the sun was shining, and I drove here today, and it was snowing. So yeah, yeah. There's, there's something to be said for not being in the studio. <clears throat> and we got to let everybody know we got uh, Chubba Chetta back with us again, a former our here. contributing editor to Car and Driver. Yep. Right? Very nice to be here. And uh, again, I also drove in through the snow, the last thing I expected after about three 50-degree days at home here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, of course, uh, let's turn uh, the focus now. Our special guest for today's show is Bob Lutz. And, Bob, it's, it's great to have you back here. It's always nice to be here. And you've been uh, a regular over the last few years, and it's, it's cool to have you here. Well, it's, it's always nice, and the compensation is good. Yeah, yeah. We pay so handsomely. <laughs> what, well, you get a bag well of chips in my, the, the green room? Well worth my services. <laughs> <laughs> so bring us up to speed, what you're doing now. You, you've been... Uh, Doing these destinos where you've, uh, well, you tell the story. Well, you know, we, we originally had it at the Detroit Auto Show in the, in the lobby area a few years ago, and we were hoping to be in production at least a year ago, but then we were delayed uh, by the Fisker bankruptcy because we needed a lot of help from them for the so-called mesh model for crash, and we needed all kinds of data for airbag recalibration and so forth, and during their period of bankruptcy, there was just nothing forthcoming. Some of it we uh, got from them once uh, Wang Chung bought it, and they uh, reestablished in business, and some of it we had to duplicate ourselves. And the, there were... Uh, it's not like in the 60s when uh, you could put a V8 engine in a four-cylinder car cobble everything together, make sure it worked halfway, and put it on the market, which is essentially what Carl Shelby did. But with today's regulations, uh, even if you're an upfitter or a small producer, you've got to meet emissions. Uh, we, we had to make sure that we met all of the um, current, the same crash requirements that the Fisker Karma met. Uh, and that took a lot of time, but we are now fully certified and uh, we're in production selling cars, and my colleagues up the road here in Auburn Hills, Gilbert Villarreal, and of course the, the, newly, re, the newly arrived Henrik Fisker, um, are putting together dealer agreements. Um, the Detroit Auto Show this year, we had a stand, which I think it was in space, that was vacated by Tesla, who decided they didn't need it this year. Um, and uh, we did get a lot of dealer inquiries and a lot of customer customer interest. So now we're producing, and we should soon be shipping. So Plus, can you expl explain to the audience what this car is. Oh, I'm because sorry. I'm, uh, um, the uh, VL Destino, and I'm, I assume you've got some visuals. That yeah, we, we, we've just been running some video of it oh, as you were yeah. speaking. Well, it's, we were uh, captivated by the Fisker Karma, as many people were, as being beautifully proportioned, beautifully surfaced, um, maybe a, a little bit deficient in rear seat package and headroom, but, you know, in that category of car, it's um, um, sort, of, sort of in the same direction as a Porsche Panamera. You're basically buying a four-door high-performance car. And um, a lot of owners, and certainly Gilbert and I, felt the car is so beautiful that it deserved uh, a better powertrain, maybe less environmentally correct. So the original was a, was a hybrid? Uh, the, the original was a lithium-ion powered battery, or a lithium-ion battery, um, that gave you an electric range of 40 to 50 miles, and then 
the range extender engine was a four-cylinder uh, GM Ecotec. And um, as, um, you know, the car was never quite fully developed. Uh, the transitions from electric drive to the four-cylinder engine were not as seamless as in the Chevy Volt when uh, that little four-cylinder engine in a 5,200-pound car uh, that was like putting a, a four-cylinder Ecotec into a Chevy into a Chevy Suburban, you know, and then <laughs> it had to work really, really hard, and it made a lot of noise. So, um, the the but the 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 main feature of the car was one a very good chassis, which was de which was all worked um, developed by a German engineering company. Um, a lot of former BMW and uh, Mercedes guys in it. And they did a really good job on ride, handling, steering, braking, 22-inch um, wheels, which made it to production as opposed to just a concept car and so forth. So the car is beautiful, and um, <clears throat> many people agreed, including Gilbert and I, that there was nothing wrong with the car that a, that a Chevy ZR1 drivetrain wouldn't fix. <laughs> Uh, so we set about doing that. We uh, got, we cobbled some together for the first Detroit show, and then in the intervening time, it's been uh, engineering, development, testing. We had the cars out in Death Valley for a while and found that with uh, the radiator that we were able to fit, the cooling is impeccable. The fuel economy is about like a ZR1, which is in on the highway in the, you know, the low 20s. Um, the car has about the same frontal area as a Corvette. It's maybe three or 400 pounds heavier than a Corvette, but it's 1,100 pounds lighter than a Fisker, so the, the, a Fis the, the original donor car. So the, the first one we put together, when it was finished, it, um, there was about this this much daylight between the top of the tires and the and the bottom of the wheel wells, so we uh, had to recalibrate springs. In fact, we didn't recalibrate; we just cut some coils off because we we really liked the same suspension characteristics. And uh, the, the car, uh, the the best way I can describe it <clears throat> is anybody. And it's a, a six-speed automatic, by the way, and. Uh, that was the six speed was all that was available when we did the car somewhere down in the future we can probably buy the new eight speed transaxle from GM but you know what with 640 horsepower I don't think you're ever going to find that you don't have enough torque uh, with a six speed so and the reason it's six speed only is because we think first of all for a high performance luxury car it's the right solution and uh, secondly, there was no way we could uh, get uh, a manual linkage in with the, the, the body, body and chassis geometry that we were working with. So we gave up on a manual. First, we thought, well, the manual's going to be easy. We don't know if we can do an automatic. And then about halfway through the development, we, we changed our minds on that. So, so have you actually delivered any Destinos? No, we're uh, in the process of delivering the first two. Uh, one of our first customers is Carlos Santana. No kidding. Um, who has a, a beautiful custom interior with uh, sort of natural tan uh, Texas saddle leather that's about a quarter of an inch thick with beautiful eagle wings carved into the door trim panel so that when you open both front doors and you look from the back, you see these two carved leather eagle wings, and then he's got little guitars carved in the headrests. And uh, a, a really gorgeous two-tone paint job, which um, Gilbert and I kept trying to talk him out of it, and he kept saying, no, I want a two-tone. He wanted dark gray metallic lower with a light silver upper with a red paint stripe. And Gilbert kept fighting him and saying, are you sure you wouldn't like it all one color? He says, no, I know exactly what I want. So I said, look, Gilbert, he's the customer. You and I might not like the paint job, but he's the guy that's paying for the car. And, and it's finished and it's gorgeous that way. And uh, 
uh, we found a way to get that red paint stripes uh, separation to where it exactly matches the surfacing of the car, which was not an easy thing to do. So, yeah, and um, I don't think there's going to be any problem with demand for the very limited, you know, modest volume expectations that we have. Now, do you have a, you know, originally, I guess you had some leftover parts from what we remained of Fisker. We still do, yeah. We, we bought up an, a bunch of, uh, you know, when, when Fisker, when, when A123 went Chapter 11, Fisker could no longer get batteries. So there were a number of cars that were basically bodies and chassis, but no electricals, which was fine with us because we had to take those out anyway. Uh, there are also um, a large number of Fiskers that are currently in a stationary condition in the United States with some sort of problem that usually battery related. What about uh, all those uh, flooded cars? W weren't there a bunch of them uh, yeah, well, caught in some flood or something yeah, somewhere? Yeah, I, I don't think we want to use those. Okay. Cars that have been underwater, you don't want to deal with. And You're not taking them sand. apart enough to yeah. to fix that? No, I don't think we'd want to, we'd want to deal with that. Okay. We're, we're, we're still looking at various alternatives to get larger quantities of uh, basically new Fiskers. But um, I think ultimately, um, almost all of the body panels we have retooled anyway. We uh, got rid of the photovoltaic glass roof. By the way, I mentioned we took 1,100 pounds out of the car. So we went from 5,200 pounds to just under 4,000. And um, one of the great weight savings was that photovoltaic glass roof, which we replaced with a carbon fiber roof with the same. Uh, the deck lid is new because we incorporated, and that's carbon fiber, and we, we incorporated a, a, a larger rear spoiler, which we needed because of our top speed, which will a, approach or be slightly over 200 miles an hour. Uh, the hood is new to clear the, the ZR1 supercharger and the front and rear fascias are new. So basically what we've got left over from the Karma is uh, doors. Hmm. And um, if at some point we have to retool the doors so that we have a supply of doors, we can do that. And you know, most of the suppliers out there, the, uh, the supplier that did the welded up uh, underbody chassis and everything um, is willing to provide as we, if and when we need, we need them, he'll send them to us. Uh, so even if the supply of new Fisker bodies were to dry up on us, and um, I, I, I don't see why it should, but if it, it were it to, uh, we, we can work around that. So, so you're and doing we, all the assembly? We can live off of conversions also for quite a while because there were like 2,800 Fiskers retailed in the United States. We're assuming that at least 500 of those were, and I know some of them personally, who really fell in love with the appearance of the car but were disappointed with the powertrain. They were not environmentally oriented people like Tesla buyers. These were guys who fell in love with the car and thought, well, it'll be okay, but then it didn't meet their expectations from a <clears throat> performance or drivability standpoint. Um, for roughly a hundred thousand dollars, we can, uh, and all these Fiskers are low mileage. So, if somebody sends us the car, we'll do we'll do the conversion, and charge them roughly half the price of a new one. You know what you say about the beauty of that car is absolutely correct, and. Uh, you know, often we see a concept car come out and it gets turned into production, and you're lucky if 80% of it makes it into production. Yeah, and usually, you say, can you say Lincoln Continental? Well, there you go. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and and there's you know compromises for cost and package and practicality. Well, but in the you, case you come off the Taurus architecture to do the Continental, it doesn't help. Well, and, and but there's a lot of examples. The yeah. original Porsche Boxster, when you looked at the concept versus the yeah. production car, and the production car is very nice. But Harm Legai, who did the car. I remember saying, you know, you're probably about 
eighty percent of the concept there, and he laughs and says, "That's pretty good." Usually, we're under seventy <laughs> percent in the transition. And uh, but the Fisker was an exception because Fisker was the designer, but he was also the CEO of the company, so he wasn't going to have any compromises. Okay. Yeah. And as a result, the package really isn't very good. But the car is it's, stunning. It's better than yeah. the Lagonda Rapide, which well, we also did. <laughs> okay, but but it is stunning. I did a video road test for Car and Driver several years ago, and I'm driving it around Beverly Hills, and it just stops traffic because, yeah. you know, you're sitting out there and, you know, regular sedans, you're looking up at them because it really is, you know, you talk about wide and low. I yeah. mean, it has that proportion like no other car. And uh, it, you know, it's appealing. My, 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 the, the whole, I think, philosophy behind the car is for anybody who has ever wanted a four-door Corvette. Yeah. This is it. It's, yeah. it's a, 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 a socially acceptable it's a socially acceptable sports car, high performance car purchase, because it does have four doors. You can take the kids with you. Uh, I have personally uh, had myself taken for a ride in the back seat. It's not something you'd want to do coast to coast, but you know it works for occasional trips around town. So you're uh, building these cars in Auburn Hills? In Auburn Hills, right. And yeah. so suppliers are bringing their parts and you guys are Putting them together and yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the the powertrain comes basically complete from GM. It's a, a ZR1 crate motor, uh, fully emission certified, and you know the weight difference is not enough to have spoiled the uh, neither the weight difference nor the slight differences in aerodynamic coefficient um, have been enough to have any effect on the on the emission. What about the weight distribution? Because in the stock car. You had the big electric motor in the back. Yeah. You had the big battery in the middle. Yeah. Both of those are gone, yeah. and you've put a heavier motor in the front. So it would seem like it's a lot more nose heavy. Yeah, but on the other hand, we have a, we have a bigger fuel tank in the back. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, boy, that was a trick trying to find room for fuel in that car, but we made it. Uh, and uh, we've got the six-speed transmission. Okay. Uh, we've got a transaxle. And uh, one nice feature on the car is, you know, we, we initially we took the Corvette um, drive shaft, the torque tube, and um, welded in a section, and uh, it just it just didn't work, and so we we replaced that with a carbon fiber unit. Mm. And that has so far proven to be absolutely perfect. So you have the rear-mounted uh, transmission and oh, transaxles. Yeah, okay, it's, it's like total. That's why I say think yeah. of it as a four-door Corvette. Okay, except it's got about uh, six to seven inches more wheelbase, which you need for that rear seat, and that's why we had to lengthen the torque tube and the drive shaft. Gotcha. Hey, uh, we're going to have to take a break here in just a minute, but we already got a question here for you. Tony D'Angelo wrote in, Bob, wants to know, what about your hybrid trucks? And, and why aren't the factories offering something like that right now? Well, that's the, the hybrid truck is another project I'm involved in. I'm, I'm non-executive chairman of the board of Via Motors, uh, and uh, Via Motors is actually in production now with uh, electric vans. We, we lost a little time on the pickup because we were more or less done on the last generation pickup, but we didn't want to start actually producing and selling those when GM was transitioning to the new generation. Uh, but what didn't change was the van, so we were able to start with the van. And uh, we've started deliveries mostly to large utilities. I will say that... Um, that is a somewhat a difficult business proposition right now because at $4.50 gas, we were able to show huge savings to the fleet with that 45 to 50 mile electric range. At $1.50 a gallon, at the, you know, the equation becomes more difficult. So I, I would say that our volume expectations on that are now somewhat more limited uh, there's still a good market because the utilities will still want a lot of these. There's still going to be, uh, when we get around to an electric Escalade, which once you've done the, the pickup in the van, that's not too hard to do. Uh, but then there'll be a lot of hotel airport limousines that never exceed 50 miles. And when the hotel isn't using them, they can just plug them in there. And, and so we still, and then there's, uh, I think, um, 
a good potential demand for military use, both U.S. and foreign uh, potential special ops where absolute silence and no heat signature is required. Uh, so there is still a market. And um, I remain optimistic, but nowhere near as optimistic as at $4.50. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole, you know, we talked about it earlier, and we could probably, it would be interesting to do a show on it, but I think the whole electric, uh, the whole electrification thing um, has, has gotten a lot more difficult. When we first showed the Destino, one of the German writers said, uh, either German or Swiss, he says, uh, this Lutz is... An amazing person. He has absolutely no convictions and no guiding philosophies. On the one hand, he's uh, chairman of a vehicle of a company that's electrifying pickups, which we laud. And on the other hand, he shows this beastly V8 powered gas guzzling high performance car. What is it with this guy? Well, what it is with this guy is I'm glad I had one foot <laughs> or one leg over the back of each horse yeah. because, um, at, you know, what $4.50, $5 gas, which was just a little ways away, uh, you had to wonder how many people were going to want Destinos. And that has now fundamentally changed. I think now the Destino is looking like a very attractive proposition. Good. Hey, uh, look, we're going to have to pay some bills here, as they uh, typically say. we got to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back. Uh, coming right out of that, we're going to get into Dr. Data has a number for us to go through. We've got a whole lot more different things to talk about. We're getting all kinds of questions from the audience. But first, we're going to give a shout-out to our friends at Firestone. Okay, we're back, and it's that time of the show where we turn to Dr. Data to, to throw a number out there. All right, there. So, so actually we have several numbers this time. So, Carmen, could you bring it up, please? And the number is $82,000. $82,000. So $82,000 is the price paid um, for a Fiat 500L used by Pope Francis when he was in Philadelphia this past September. And if we look to see what the... Um, base price of that car is, it's $19,495. Now we'll compare that with another number. It's $1.2 million. So what is $1.2 million? That's the price that was paid at auction for VIN 1 for the Acura NSX, so yet to be built car. So if you look at the base price for what the Acura NSX is, it's $156,000, okay? So I began to think about those two numbers and contrasting those two things that just happened very close in time in terms of uh, Pope's car and the NSX. And something occurred to me that in the event that Francis is made a saint, the value of that 500L will be priceless. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, uh, by the time he's made a saint, nobody who owns the car today is probably going to be around. Eh, we'll see. <laughs> if we even have Catholicism left by then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so lots of other things uh, going on uh, in this business right now. I'd like to throw this out to all of you guys. What do you make of uh, Fiat Chrysler axing the Dodge Dart and uh, the 200? Chubb, I'll start with you on this. Well, you know, I had heard rumors that when uh, Jack Nasser was running Ford, at some point he looked at the numbers and said, we make money on uh, trucks, we lose it on cars, why are we even building cars? But then you were just talking about 450 a gallon gasoline versus buck 50 a gallon gasoline. Plus the fact you got to meet the law. Well, you got to meet the law, although, you know, there are separate fuel economy standards for trucks and cars, and I guess you could do it, but at some point, you know, if, if gas gets expensive again and people want to go back to more efficient vehicles, you better have some to sell, and it seems to me this is very short-term thinking. Well, but he's going to outsource them. Well, and so he says. Do, he's going to do what? But, but who's going to build them? Well, he, he, he says he, another automaker. Well, I don't... Wait a minute. Uh, it could be one of the uh, nascent, more capable Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could also be Hyundai Kia. He could even do a deal with one of the other domestic companies where he'll say, um, you know, just 
give me a version of the Chevy Cruze. Uh, we'll keep all the hard points. We'll keep the windshield and backlight and all that stuff. But we'll we'll spend the we'll spend the the twenty or thirty million for unique sheet metal, and we'll call that one Dodge Dart, and it'll be zero margin, but it'll be zero margin without a lot of invested capital that has to be written off. So um, we we did the same thing at Chrysler for a while when we imported the Mitsubishi Colts and rebadged them Dodge and Plymouth, because at the end of the day. Um, if the margins on your small stuff are bad enough, uh, you can afford to import or buy from a competitor, restyle a little bit, rebadge, and sell at a variable loss, and you're better off than selling at break even, but then writing off. Um, Seven or eight hundred million dollars of invested capital. But what does, what's in it for the company who's actually selling well, them the bits? Because the problem is, you've got to make. First of all, uh, your your dealers probably cannot survive uh, without a full line of vehicles. No, no. But I'm saying when you mentioned your example of, uh, say, getting a version of the Chevy Cruze. Yeah. I mean, I understand GM gets some economies of scale because yeah. they manufacture, yeah. but the GM dealers turn around, the Chevy dealers turn around and say, you guys out of your mind, you're now going to sell, sell a cut rate version of our car to our competitors who are going to undercut us with yeah. the same car. And, and, you know, and the economies of scale run out at a certain point, so I mean, making more that, isn't going to... That's true, but um, I, I still think that they could probably find somebody that would do their, you know, their hundred thousand, two hundreds, and their hundred thousand uh, Dodge Darts, and that shouldn't be too big a problem. And that manufacturer can make uh, two to maybe a, a very thin margin on like a thousand bucks or fifteen hundred bucks a car, selling them to FCA. FCA in turn uh, wholesales them, and the, that would have to be part of an agreement that they wholesale them at the same price or, or actually the the company supplying the cars through pricing can control what the, what the wholesale price is going to be and that way you can be a full line, full line producer and look this has been going on forever i mean but on but on, but on smaller scale and and remember when well, there was that talk of this is this is pretty small scale well, well i mean yeah. john, john you it's going to go smaller you you've said on the show many times about the dart that it just never really launched correctly no it was underpowered when it launched and look what dodge needs is like its own wrx you know they 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 need this hot real hot you know rally car was, kind of hat it was also uh compared to the ford focus which is visually exciting mm -hmm. you know it's got good gesturing it 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 looks mm -hmm. like it's moving through the air and, and, and uh, i mean a, a, a good a good well set up focus with the right wheels is a nice looking car the chevy cruise is an entirely different styling philosophy but it's wide it looks ample it's epa mid-size in fact the rental companies ran it out as a mid-size car so you're giving the customer a lot of value for the money, and that worked. And but besides, the Cruise has a great road, road. I'm talking the old one. Mm. The new one, I think, is even better. But the old one has a great road presence. And the Dart just kind of sat there. I mean, it right. was professional styling, but there was nothing that made you want to reach for your wallet. Well, also, you got into one of those cars with the 1.4 liter engine and the dual clutch transmission, and it was kind of gutless and it was a dog and I mean, that, uh, you know it just saying. wasn't it was a fun thing to drive okay what, what, what's the possibility that that both the chrysler 200 which i think is a handsomely styled car um that it's okay well yeah, it looks I, like it, it, everybody I, else I, i'm with gary i think the 200 looks pretty good and and okay i so, agree but tell me where where it where it's in any way significantly different from a hyundai sonata or a ford fusion <laughs> Okay. No. I, I, All right. But I'll, I'll buy that. But, yeah. but since since somebody goes to a dealer and and now that most it's you know Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, all in the same store. Okay. So somebody walks in, and there's a Dart over there, and there's a Chrysler 300 over there, and there's a Wrangler over there. I mean, and and so 
I think that maybe the dart in certain regards just gets lost, the 200 gets lost, and you know, the guy's gonna say, well, you know what? We got this Grand Cherokee here, and the car payment is only gonna be a few bucks more. You might really wanna get this. And as a result of that, that these, these vehicles, because they don't necessarily have uh, high distinctiveness compared to other vehicles, so, I mean, you make, you know, do you want a Challenger or do you want a Dart? Probably not a... Okay, ju jumping topics here, uh, but sticking with the, uh, this theme of getting axed, what do you all make of Scion, the brand going away? Well, In 13 years through. they tried it. Not a moment too soon. Yeah. I, th I think it was <laughs> almost DOA. Um, it was kind of, to me, it was like, I, I liken it to remember GM's Geo brand, yeah. which was going to be the repository of all the small imports and they're gonna be branded Geo, and it's gonna be a really cool brand for young people, and all of the advertising was sort of beach parties and surfboards and all of the usual, the, the usual 55-year-old advertising guys saying, we really understand this youth market. And, uh, you know, Geo flopped, and I don't think Scion had any memorable cars. With the original XB, XB. which yes. was a little boxy one, but if you'll remember, that was essentially sold in Japan as a panel version. It was really like a little delivery vehicle yeah, it, that, that Scion or Toyota said, hey, that's perfect, we'll bring it over here, put some windows and seats in it, and that actually sold pretty well. Yeah, well it was, but it didn't, it didn't sell to any young people. Most, no. If you look through the window at who's driving well, but it, that's, here's a picture but of the that, original I mean, one. That's, that's the case of... I mean, every, every youth oriented. But, but here's HHR, another thing. I, I don't know PT if you've Cruiser, got it, but look at this boxy one. Correct. Same, same so that, thing that's that happened. The original, and, that, that's yeah. the original, which was not really styled, right? So this thing came off for what it was, Scion launching it, sold pretty good. Carmen, do we have the, the redesign of it? Well, the redesign was Toyotaized. Okay. They're, well, they're it was also for. 600 pounds heavier. It was, it was Blandsville. It was totally Blandsville. And it was, you know, in some ways a better car. It was oh. quieter, it was oh, more yeah, refined. Right. But it, all, suddenly it was another well, Toyota, you know. When, you're, but doing, the other when thing, you're doing cool stuff, better car doesn't matter. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, and you know, there, there was always a... Here's the new, uh, uh, the, the subsequent yeah, the generation. And, and the point I'm trying to make is, what, there was an authenticity to the original one yes, because it was yes. a delivery vehicle. Okay. And then they went, oh, to your point, Bob, we know, we know what the kids want, and this thing came out, and it went nowhere. Actually, well, actually, though, it was actually styled by a guy who was essentially a kid, so just to, okay. to be fair. Well, okay. But, okay, so so everybody <laughs> says science of failure. A lot of kids could do old guys' cars. <laughs> That's true. Okay so, 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 okay, so I looked at the numbers. Okay, so last year, 56,167 science were sold, okay? Um, of all models. Of all models. Yeah. And there's okay. like That's, five of them or something. Uh, not that many. You can't make okay. in a brand at those levels. Last year, Lincoln Cars, so we'll take the trucks out because Scion didn't have a truck, right? 37,778. Total Fiat, 42,410. Then I thought, let's throw in a little light truck action here. Volkswagen, okay? Light truck for Volkswagen. Last year, Tiguan and Torag, 42,880. Total smarts, 7,484. Total Volvo car, 23,253. Total Mitsubishi car, which we just were talking about, 39,321. Cyan so beat them all. But, but you're, 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 that this is the, uh, being the valedictorian of the reform school. Well. <laughs> Somebody's got to be. <laughs> well, also, a lot of those other brands are more expensive brands where they may be lower volume, but there's more margin or potentially more margin in, in, in the cars. So it's a different business. You know, the, the Scion thing was always schizophrenic. I was at the initial launch of Scion. I think it was at the New York Auto Show, and Jim Lentz was the first president of yep. Scion. Who's no, now, I thought it was Farley. No, no, it was Lentz, I think. Or Lentz was doing this presentation. Okay. But he was up there talking about the youthful buyers and the young buyers and how they're completely different and they don't want to be marketed to. And then he turns around and says, here's how we're going to market the car. <laughs> and you sit there and, you know, I, I mean, I kind of know what he's saying, but that contradiction is ultimately something they never coped See, with. What, automobile companies are <clears throat> invariably run by conservative elderly gentlemen now with a sprinkling of, of females in there too. But uh, what everybody keeps forgetting is it is a hopeless proposition to try to, for an OEM, to try to create a car for young people. 
because young people fundamentally cannot afford new cars. And if you look at the real aspiration, the real aspiration car for young people uh, is some sort of hot used car. And uh, you look at the nation's college campuses, one of the most ubiquitous cars on college campuses are uh, six to eight year old BMW 3 Series. Right. So <laughs> if you say um, the, the youth car, the aspirational youth car, uh, perennially, and it seems to transcend generations, tends to be uh, a, a well-used, um, maybe handed down within the family, but it tends to be uh, an aspirational brand that has lost a lot of its value. So, Bob, was it a mistake for Toyota to do Scion? Pardon? Was it a mistake for Toyota well, to I, do Scion? I, I think, you know, uh, Toyota was looking at a, uh, uh, a Buick-like problem where they had great owner loyalty, but those owners were getting older and older and older. And uh, Toyota was very worried about uh, getting a fuddy-duddy image and kids not wanting to buy the same car that, that, the, that in which they uh, grew up in the back seat of when their parents drove. So I think from a marketing logic standpoint, uh, it was good. But um, I think the follow-through was bad. Uh, and if they had done more of what I think it was the XB, the, yeah. the, the, the little, yep. uh, the boxy car, uh, that was kind of cute. And they could have, they could have miniized that really and done hot versions and cool versions and versions with bigger wheels and, uh, you know, matte paint versions. I mean, they could have played that tune in many different ways and played on that. And instead, what, what they, what they did is they basically never created a car for Scion. They took stuff out of the broad global Toyota portfolio and said, hmm, we can't really put that one in the Toyota brand. I'll tell you what, maybe Scion would like to have it, you know, and then and they wound up, oh, the little coupe wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah the, the little the, that they did with Subaru. The, or, no, well, the, no, no, the TC. Yeah, that was, oh, that oh. was the first one, and then the okay. FRS was the one they did with Subaru. Yeah. No, the the the, uh, su the one with Subaru is is later, and that's yeah. another story. Right. But I'm I'm talking about the little front engine, front wheel drive. Uh, well, that was the closest one to a performance car, although yeah. because they took I think the big engine from the Camry and put it in the relatively lighter car. But something that would have been more overtly performing might have uh, helped energize the brand a or little bit. Or they could have just kept the Supra. Okay, let, let's go on to another yeah. one that's getting revived. Uh, Jeep's going to come out with a truck, and uh, looks like they're going to call it the Scrambler. Uh, Carmen, I think we got a picture of uh, Scrambler going back to the, the early 80s. Uh, what do you guys make of uh, them going into trucks and bringing back this name? Do you have a picture of the J2, the, the one that was on the big architecture? Um. I don't it think we've got the, that picture ready. No. It was on the same architecture as the Grand Wagoneer, mm -hmm. and it was a you know a pretty great big pickup truck, body on frame, and the people that had those were in love with them and are now collectors' items. And if you go out to Wyoming, so forth, they're uh, probably mostly held together with uh, duct tape and bondo now. But uh, those those were indestructible. I, to me, there is nothing. Uh, discordant about Jeep and pickup trucks. I think it's eminently logical, and I'm uh, totally surprised they haven't done it before now. Yeah. Bob, but when you, when you were at General Motors, didn't wasn't there an H3 pickup that yeah. had a small bed on it? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. so, so you were, so well, for those who don't know, it, I mean... It, the problem with that was the J2 was body on frame, and the volume on that had gone down along with Grand Wagoneer volume. And um, finally, we just concentrated on Grand Wagoneers, and we did 10,000 of those a year, and then we stopped it, and it was replaced by the Grand Cherokee. The the little pickup, which, what the heck was the name of that thing? It was uh, it was off the uh, Cherokee architecture. And so it was body on frame. And, you know, frankly, body on frame just doesn't make very good pickups. I'm sorry. No, uh, it was unibody. Unibody, unibody right. does not make very good pickups. So that was, um, I'll think of the name of that thing in a second, but uh, it was not a sales success. The, the interesting thing about that is uh, 
you know, I think an open market segment is for a cheap, small pickup. And when I say small, I mean the size of an S10 or a Ranger from the early 90s, yeah. which is quite a bit smaller than the, uh, you know, the, the, Colorado. the Colorado right now, which are a you know, good size. Mm -hmm. But it has to be cheap. And this is in that direction. The question is, what would it cost? But, yeah, but you can have a cheap Jeep. There's I mean, no just, well, that's it. Cheap yeah. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's, that's right. So maybe the, someone else has to do that. But I think a truck well, like we, that we at 15,000 bucks Robert Davis sell. of Mazda about yeah. the possibility of having a, a cheap small truck, and they 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 ran the numbers at Mazda and said they could, yeah they couldn't make the numbers make work. But that's yeah. Mazda. Well, but there's there's a case you just touched on it. If they had another member of the consortium who would take thirty or forty thousand, and then a third member of the consortium who would take thirty or forty thousand, then you'd be close to a hundred thousand, and it would pay. And uh, that's what um, Pontiac did with Toyota with the Vibe. Mm -hmm. It was one of right. the... Yeah, yeah makers and, and, and I'll tell you, I know I'm getting back on the list. Yeah, that's I'll be okay. pretty quick, but it, just to make a point there, uh, the Vibe was a money loser, but it was nowhere near the money loser that it would have been if GM had <laughs> told the it thing itself. itself. <laughs> yeah. right. Hey, uh, look, we got to take a, another quick break here, and uh, but we got... A whole lot more that we can talk about. I, I'd like to hear some of your guys' views on the VW uh, situation and where that's going. Uh, we might be able to talk a little bit about GM Racing, 24-hour uh, of Daytona, which was pretty interesting. But, but first, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to uh, come right back. We're going to give a shout-out to our friends at Hankel. A little chemistry goes a long way, especially when it comes to vehicle development. From enabling the use of alternate materials to withstanding extreme vehicle environments, Henkel's adhesive, sealants, and surface technologies provide solutions for every vehicle segment. Come see for yourself. Our Detroit area headquarters offers 12 research and development and testing laboratories with the ability to do full range testing and validation on actual vehicle parts. Sign up to tour our labs at henkelna.com forward slash tour. We uh, wrote in to say, uh, the Cherokee pickup was called the Comanche. That's right. The Thank Comanche. You. Yeah. So, Bob, what do you make of Volkswagen? I know you, you wrote a pretty uh, interesting article in Road and Track magazine saying this is the, the whole state of fear that was created under Ferdinand yeah, Piac. Yeah, it's, it's a cultural thing. And uh, I, I don't think any of us believe the version that there were two rogue engineers who installed that software and nobody knew about it. Uh, that that kind of... Um, stretches credibility but uh yeah I, I think when you have a culture and i i used to teach some ethics classes at exide when i was ceo and we had these pre-packaged little excise uh, little courses where you'd show a film clip and then the class would discuss it discuss it and one of them was when the boss is at the at the conference table and he says this next quarter everybody is going to make their targets and I don't want anybody failing. Whoever fails to meet their targets this quarter, out. So you guys get me, get me straight. You do whatever you have to do to make those numbers. Is that clear? And with that management style, people say, well, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And they'll start falsifying numbers and doing fictitious sales and start cooking the books and everything because it's job preservation. And when you've got the choice between going to the boss and saying, you know what, you're crazy, nobody can make that. He says, out, and you're gone immediately. So when you're, when you're uh, faced with the choice between immediate dismissal and dismissal two years from now when they find out about it, all of us would pick, you know, Ethics aside, but many of us would <laughs> many of us would pick. I'll cheat today, and I'll deal with it later. It's human nature. And uh, Ferdinand Piech uh, was that kind of guy. He he absolutely did not tolerate anybody telling him it can't be done. Uh, we don't have enough time. We can't get there with this hardware. Uh, a little anecdote: When I con I congratulated him on the a new golf in Frankfurt, I think it was probably in 86. And I, it was the first golf with these beautiful, like three to four millimeter body caps. And I said, these body caps are terrific. I'm happy, I saw so him at a VDA dinner um, during the Frankfurt show. And he says, you like that? I said, yeah, it's terrific. I wish we could do that at Chrysler. He said, I have, I have the recipe for you. 
And I said, really, I'd be interested to hear it. He says, I call everybody from body engineering, stamping people into my office. I said, I'm tired of these lousy body caps. In six weeks, I want perfect body caps. So you have six weeks. I have all your names. I know who you are. If six weeks from now, I do not have these perfect bodies, you are all fired. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Get to work. <laughs> have and, a nice day. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I said, he said, so that's how I did it. And I said, well, see, I, uh, I, I don't think that that, that method would, would like quite work at an, at an American company like Chrysler. And he said, aha, you do, not, you, you do not want it. See, that is the difference between you and me. You are soft and I am hard. I want, but you would like to have. And when you, when you would like to have, you will never achieve your target. When I want something, I get it. And I thought, holy mackerel, I'm glad, I'm glad fate never put me as a direct report to this guy because I don't think I'd last a week. <laughs> how, how did, I admire Piek as probably the greatest automotive product genius in the history of this industry. But I would not have cared to work for him. Okay. And sooner or later, that sort of dictatorial behavior will result in something like the diesel thing. So how did it take so long for the diesel thing to come out? I mean, I'm sure that everybody at every auto company in the yeah, world were looking we, at we, that. And but the problem is we put them on the test rig. And I, I, I mean, my eternal thing with the GM, in fact, Rick Wagner sent me an email and says, I well remember those discussions with the engine guys <laughs> because I'd, I'd beat up the GM engine guys and say, what do you mean we can't do a diesel for the United States? And they say, well, we just can't get there on NOx especially. I said, well, then how come Volkswagen can do it? I said, well, you know, we're asking ourselves the same question, but we put the, on, with that hardware, we've installed the identical hardware on our diesels we, with from the same suppliers, calibrated for our engines, we can't get there. We're miles away. Uh, but we put their vehicles on test and they pass. So, so I said, well, that gets then. I guess I have to surmise that the Volkswagen diesel guys are smarter than our diesel guys. And they, you know, they didn't like that, but they said, we just can't explain it. And I think um, every manufacturer that was either working on a diesel f for the U.S. or was thinking of working on a diesel up for the U.S. had the same reaction. We, we, we know they're doing it, but we don't know how they're doing it. Yeah, you'd think at some point someone would have, at one of these manufacturers trying to figure this out, would have gone a little deeper because obviously the secret is in the calibration. Yeah. You know, they recognize the tests, switch to a different yeah, calibration. When the rear wheels weren't turning. Well, I'm not sure that's how they recognized yeah, the test. It was. Well, no, no, keep in mind. There were several things. There were several things. Yeah, okay. Because modern cars have traction control. So to put them on a test, you already have to turn the traction control off. So you're already signaling the car that there's something unusual going on. But you could also have the computer just say, I'm on the emissions test. It starts out with a 20 second idle, followed by five seconds of three mile per hour oh. per second. You recognize that. That's the US emission cycle right, right there. Yeah. But the point is, you know, you think at some point someone would have said, well, what calibration are they running? Because clearly they sacrificed uh, the calibration in order to make the emissions, and the emissions test is slow enough and has mild enough acceleration that even if you're throwing away some drivability, it's just not going to show up. Power and, torque, and, yeah. and no one noticed that. Uh, well, that I'm been not the so sure, because my theory is it was the, this international consortium on clean transportation that hired the University of West Virginia yeah. to go <laughs> conduct the test. They claimed the ICCT that they were trying to prove to European regulators yeah, that's what that they, they could getting. have tighter standards. Yeah. My theory, I don't believe that story. I think, think somebody that, blew were, the whistle. And I, that's no, the cover I, no, story. I, I believe that story because what this group was, uh, was trying to do was counter the European manufacturers' drive to hold European diesel emissions where they were. Right. And these guys said, uh, this group uh, said, well, why are they fighting a standard that they can easily or apparently easily meet in the U.S. where uh, the NOx requirements are six to ten times worse than, than Euro 5 and Euro 6? Uh, so I, I think it started out innocently enough that so they got some, you know, uh, uh, TDIs in the U.S., uh, ran them, or, or, and I, I don't know, they probably ran them on 
on the on the highway before they showed them to the European regulators. But the whole the whole thing was to convince the European regulators, don't listen to these guys. They can do it because they're doing it for the U.S. Right. Where the where the uh, the regs are even tighter. Are they going to be able to fix it, folks? No, I don't think so, and that's why they just. In Germany, I think they were they were, or Europe. They were much closer because of the, the the laxer standard. And I saw the illustrations. I couldn't figure it out. They the fin straightening. Yeah, they, they put, right out of the J C Whitney I, catalog. That's <laughs> awfully hard to buy. I, it is, and I think I think you know Germany Incorporated doesn't want anything bad to happen to Volkswagen. So they probably told them, look, do something, and uh, do something, and we're sure it'll be fixed. But the U.S. Uh, won, won much tighter regs, and secondly, uh, the EPA and CARB are not going to bend on this. And in my judgment, with the hardware they've got, uh, with the hardware they've got, there is no way they can they can meet the standard. So, how does the Chevy Cruze meet it? Well, the Chevy Cruze meets it with way more hardware. Well, as the SCR catalyst, you know, which you can't easily retrofit to a yeah, car. Yeah, that's the problem. You can't retrofit right. these cars, cars. So now the word is Volkswagen may buy back non-compliant cars. It's basically the only thing they can do. And, you know, I, I did some very simple math. I, I, I'm thinking that's about a $5 billion oh, bill. Oh, Plus least. they're fine. Yeah. Plus the fine. And, yeah. and it seems to me that VW is just not managing this very well. No, well, that's what I wanted to hear what you guys think about. I, I think they're managing this about as poorly as could be done. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, it's dragging on forever, for one thing. Now, you know, it's, it's gone on for months and months and months. There's no clear culprits or culprits who have been identified. There's no clear solutions to the problem. Then uh, Mueller comes over here and does that uh, interview on NPR where I don't know if he misspoke or what the heck, but he said, well, we really weren't cheating. We just misunderstood the standards and they had to retract <laughs> yeah. that. And we never yeah. lied. NPR. Yeah. yeah. And right. then they, they kind of tried to pull that back very quickly, but mm. it's misstep after misstep, it seems. Well, and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, the whole thing is, is pretty astonishing. And then for a while, they tried, well, we think this is some sort of um, nefarious plot by, be, between the U.S. industry and the U.S. government to keep, to keep uh, German competition at bay. And I'll tell you, that, is, that version is widespread in, in, uh, in, in the Germany. European public. I know it. I that, know it. Uh, it's incredible. The, the Volkswagen diesels, the, believe me, they passed, but the German, the American government uh, did this to keep German competition out. And, and whenever I hear that from a European, I said, the volume, the total volume of Volkswagen diesels, diesel is not a popular thing in the United States. It's a tiny little fringe market. And believe me, the Detroit Three and Toyota and all the others were certainly not worried but about the, that taking over. But do the other German makers buy into this? Because, no. you know, basically, if, if you're Opel and you are selling cars that had the SCR catalyst yeah. to meet the standards, and, of course, you had to pay for the SCR catalyst and price the car accordingly yeah. or take the margin hit accordingly, or, you or would take, not or be... Take, or take the loss accordingly, yeah. There you go. You would not feel sympathetic towards Volkswagen, it seems to no, me. No, but yeah. you know what? Um, it, it's an unwritten rule in the industry that you never, never, never publicly kick a competitor when, when he's in a situation like this. Um, you know, we were at the time of Toyota unintended acceleration. I, I sort of, I was still at GM and I rubbed my hands with glee because I said, you know, the finally the, um, the emperor has no clothes or is certainly growing more naked like the rest of us. And, uh, I had some one liners that I was going to, and boy, they, GM just totally shut me down and said, not one word about Toyota sudden acceleration, uh, no talk about we don't have it, or no talk about our floor mats are designed so that the, the accelerator doesn't hang up, nothing. Just if you're asked about Toyota sudden acceleration, say, that's their problem, not ours, no comment. So that's, that's pretty much the rule in the industry, which I occasionally violate. Is, sure. is, 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 <laughs> is, is Volkswagen irreparably harmed in this market? I, I don't think any more than 
Toyota was irreparably harmed by uh, uh, unintended acceleration or GM was irreparably harmed by ignition locks. Yeah. Hey, the public uh, has a short memory. They, they do. Uh, we got a phone call here. Somebody has got something to say about the, the VLF. Uh, Carmen, why don't we bring in that phoner? Hey, guys, this is Youngblood calling from Cleveland, Ohio. Got a uh, comment for Mr. Lutz. Mr. Lutz, your new Force One, outstanding, excellent. I wish you a whole bunch of luck on it. I know you'll get the job done because hoorah, sir, Semper Fi. That's it. Later. Good luck. Bye. Semper Fi to you too, Marine. Uh, hey, I, I think he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. We had another one. The Force One. You didn't have any pictures. No, we didn't have the yeah. Force One. I'm sorry, and I apologize Do for it that. Next time. Scott wants to know what, if anything, did your Marine Corps experience do for you in the automotive business? Uh, that's a that's a really good question. I I love it. It's one of my favorites. I think the uh, my time in the Marine Corps was the foundation of any modest success that I may have had in life, and it's, uh, it gave me focus, um, and I think um, it made me confident in my leadership skills. I think it gave me the right blend of uh, being hard and uncompromising when that was called for, being flexible and a halfway decent listener when that was the more appropriate style. I think the Marine Corps is the best leadership school in the world. Wright Knight wants to know, do you still own the rights to Cunningham, and will it ever come back? Uh, I do not, uh, I, and I never did. The rights always kind of belonged to uh, uh, Briggs III, and uh, we had that falling out because of... He, he misunderstood the fact that the second-round investors paid more for the shares than the first-round investors did. And he said, if, if the second round paid five bucks and you and I paid one buck, why aren't my shares worth five dollars? And I said, because we're first round investors. Someday, hopefully, they'll be worth a lot more. And he said, well, I was scammed and, um, and sued me in Kentucky, which was dismissed because uh, it was the wrong venue. I had never done business in Kentucky. And then he, and the judge said, I can't rule on this, but were I to, were I to rule, I would rule that this is a frivolous lawsuit without any basis. Despite this, he comes and brings the lawsuit to Michigan, which cost me personally, uh, again, a lot of money besides what I lost on the car. Uh, and he lost that one too. But all of the investors that we had, we had over $80 million lined up to fund the car. And um, I just... Uh, I've got a picture of it on my phone. Take me too long to yeah, find yeah. it right now, but <laughs> uh, but I looked at I looked at the photograph of that car with minor tweaks. It would still be okay today. Hmm. Um, when we were promoting the fact that you were going to be on the sh show today, we we sent out an email blast, and they were asking me, so how should we identify Bob? You know, because at GM or a Chrysler or a VLF or whatever. And, and I said, call him the Capo de Tutti Capi. <laughs> and so Armand wrote in to say, what was with the capo de tutti capi in your email? And you can translate that. Yeah, it means uh, uh, the boss of bosses. Right, the boss of all bosses. Yep. And I remember you telling me that, I don't know, this goes back years and years ago, and we were talking about something, and uh, we were trying to come up with how we should refer to you, and I said, you know, Dwight Eisenhower always said that Supreme Commander had a nice ring to it. And you came up with Capo de Tutti Capi. So that's what we used in the email today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, and, and, and I always say Emperor will do too. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's sort of grandiose for a guy who was never even CEO of a car company. <laughs> so, uh, what do you make of GM these days? They just posted eye popping profits. Well, it's a well-run company, and um, it's now focusing uh, on margins rather than volume. One of the things that distressed me when I, when I was at the company is we were there was this incredible drive for market share, as if losing market share was somehow <clears throat> going to be fatal to the company. And uh, I once had a, a long argument with Rick Wagner about uh, how much money we were giving away to. Uh, on incentives and daily rental discounts and lease subsidies and everything. And he said, we cannot afford to let the volume go down. Well, of course you. And I said, but, but Rick, if we have 
zero margins multiply zero times four million, it's still zero. I'd rather, I'd rather have some and multiply by three million. And he said, don't start teaching me automotive finance because that's my field, not yours. But, uh, but uh, at any rate, um, there's now a focus on margins. General Motors is, if you go to the daily rental companies, you'll see relatively few General Motors cars and now more and more Korean and Japanese cars. A complete reversal of what the situation was 15 years ago. Because now it's Ford and GM that own the retail space. And the Asians are having to do more and more discount. Remember when people used to say, well, if Japanese cars aren't better, how come they sell without incentives and you guys are giving four and $5,000 away? Well, now, you know, everybody's at about the same incentive level, but the, the Japanese advantage in that, in that area has gone away. So General Motors is now margin focused. Plus, I maintain, and I can now say this because I've been gone for six years, so I'm not praising my own work. You'd be hard pressed to find a large OEM with a better overall product portfolio than GM right now. I mean, trucks are outstanding, full-size SUVs are outstanding, Camaro is off the chart, Corvette is off the chart, the new, uh, the new La Malibu is an incredible car. Sensational looking. And, and so it, well, and look at the fuel economy, and, and it's a, have you driven it? I mean, it's a, yep. like driving a luxury car. So uh, the company is in good hands, and General Motors has re rediscovered what they had in the 60s and subsequently lost which is you can't go wrong by building better vehicles, <laughs> even, if, even if they cost 100 bucks or 200 bucks more. Hey, one, one more uh, uh, audience question, then we'll get back to these guys. Albert wants to know, what's your impression of uh, the 2017 Pacifica minivan? I think it's a very good minivan execution, and I think it'll work well for Chrysler. Um, I like this sort of little, uh, you know, more crossovery theme to it. Uh, the interior is very good. Uh, the front end is the, the kind of Chrysler 200, but mm -hmm. okay, corporate ID. Um, I think it's fine. Uh, the, the one element of the vehicle that I don't like is the wraparound backlight. Um, you know, seen before on the Mercedes A class, and mm -hmm. it's to me, it's a styling gimmick that doesn't work very well. But but overall, I give them high marks and. Uh, you know, despite all of the Japanese competition, um, Chrysler remains the minivan master. Uh, they've got the owner body. Um, uh, they, they just do a really outstanding minivan, and I think this one's going to continue in that tradition. Mm -hmm. Hey, wh what do you guys make of uh, 24 Hours of Daytona? And uh, Chaba, you're the racer here. Uh, uh, and, 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 and concurrent with that, GM just announcing this powertrain racing development center. I don't know if you're up on the details of that. No, I, I, I haven't seen that press release yet. Uh, I know it was just going on a couple days ago, but uh, you know, Corvette's had a tremendous success in racing over the years. And at this point they're working, the racing team's working closely with the production team. I think that's great to yep. see, you know, where you don't end up with a race car that's utterly unrelated to the street car. And even, you know, the engine stuff, as we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, they're running a pushrod V8. I mean, I'm more of an overhead cam guy. Guy, but uh, they're demonstrating that that engine can get the job done, and yeah, they're continuing get, on. Uh, Seven thousand RPM. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the, the NASCAR guys are turning like nine thousand RPM on some of these things with uh, pushrod push V8s. It's right. just absolutely astonishing. It's nothing you. Would, of course, they're not running quite twenty-four hours, but yeah. uh, and these races are all, the, the cars are all equalized. But uh, you know, GM racing is very strong, and it's very appropriate, especially for a car like the Corvette. Does it pay benefits to the engineers within a corporation to have racing the way Chuba's describing? Uh, well, I think you've, you've always got uh, a core group of really enthusiastic young engineers who come in. And, and some guys, you know, they want to do work on door mechanisms. <clears throat> and uh, they're, they, uh, I would say they're solid engineers, but they're not car enthusiasts. And you, you, need, uh, you need a batch of those. You can't have everybody wanting to work on high performance, but you very, you very quickly uh, identify the enthusiasts and it's probably the guys that when they were in engineering school, they were part of the Formula, uh, Formula SAE team and so forth. And, and they've just got racing and high performance and the competitive instinct in their blood. And the, 
uh, a company like GM finds those people and uh, they work with incredible energy. And I, I always say a motivated engineer in the same eight hour day will accomplish three times what an unmotivated engineer will do because it's easy as an engineer, it's easy to sit behind. If you're not motivated and you think you hate your job, you hate the company, but it's a paycheck, uh, you can easily waste time staring at your laptop screen and, and pretending to work. But the highly motivated, motivated engineer, they'll look at their watch and say, "Go on, four thirty already." You know, I mean, it's 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 amazing. And those 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 people, and every company has some of those. I mean, remember the glory days of Honda motorcycles <clears throat> and uh, Honda Formula One engines and everything. Um, and it, when a company has it, it's good to nurture that because those are the people that will drive the state of the art forward. Is this what, a good time for automotive engineers? As you look back over time, I mean, you think now is a, is a good time for young people to say, yes, I'm gonna go into yes, the absolutely. auto industry? I think, um, to me, the, the automobile is at a, its absolute zenith right now in terms of technology and technological advancement. And uh, the automobile today is where it's happening, uh, whether it's connectivity, uh, combustion technology, electronic technology, it's everything. A uh, hugely exciting time. Now, will it be 20 years from now when we have fully autonomous modules that are driverless and have no steering wheel? Well, somebody's going to have to engineer those too, but it'll be interesting to see the first 24-hour race of normalized e steering wheel-less econo boxes <laughs> duking it out for 24 <laughs> hours. There, there are already people proposing autonomous car races like yeah. within the next couple of years. Right and uh, it, it's a, it, it seems crazy on, on a certain level and who wants to watch that. As a development tool, it actually might be pretty oh, no. interesting and to I, see I, how I that think of, yeah. you can't see, In Formula One, you can't see the drivers anymore. Yeah, that's anyway. right. Yeah. right. <laughs> Might as well have robots Just in there. Put a little colored bump in the that's middle right. of the car. Right. Yeah, you, you, you make the uh, laser designator look like a helmet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Hey, look, we've used up an hour here. This has been a great discussion. We could easily go on another hour, but we're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah. So, Bob Lutz, thanks so much for coming back on the show. It's awesome having you here, as always. Thank you very much. Chubba Chutta, great having you here, as always, too. Fun as usual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, Gary, let's do it again next week. Yeah, we'll do it here. And, and in the studio, no less. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by... Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There is all that and much more at Autoline.tv.